Hi, I'm Dr. Nikita Visniak with the amazing Tony McDonald. And today we are going to go through some lab safety and techniques that you might want to use in the cadaver lab to help make your job go easier and save yourself some time and potentially injury. We want to make you feel more confident, more competent, and be safe from day one in the lab. Yep, and this hopefully will accelerate that process. So, first thing we're going to talk about is some of the instruments that we will be using and then progressing our way through some of their usage. So we're going to start off with our beginning point here, looking at gloves, and we'll pass this off to Tony for some of our key things that we want to make sure we understand. For safety's sake, gloves need to fit you snugly. If there's extra material in the palm, or if the fingers are too long, or if the wrists are baggy, then the glove is too big for you. You need to just choose a smaller glove. Uh, if you're having a hard time putting a smaller glove on, uh, because maybe your uh, hand is a little bit moist, you get that sticky thing going. <laughs> We're going to skip forward to if you've taken the clean glove off and the fingers are inverted. If there's a little bit of air in the glove and you just squeeze the air, the, glove, the fingers will go back to excessive. That's a simple way to do it. Another way to do it that I like because it's more fun with the kids. You've taken your glove off and it's all messed up. You don't know what to do. And again, this is only for clean gloves that haven't touched anything. You can take it, set it up, and blow it out and you've got a little little chicken that you can go ahead and dance around with. So another way to do it. So if you've got yourself a little bit of a sticky situation, literally with your glove and you're having a hard time putting your glove on, a little bit of talcum powder or cornstarch or something in the glove, get a little bit of a shake, and then it's much easier to pull your glove on. The other thing that I'll point out for the gloves as well is there are lots of different sizes. So if you are concerned about which size actually fits you, try different size gloves out to make sure that they fit you correctly. If you do sweat a lot, I do recommend the use of the powders as well, just to avoid the extra stickiness that you see with the gloves. Gloves that are too large inhibit your control of your tools, and you're using sharp tools. So you're going to end up needing a band-aid or stitches if you can't control your scalpel. Yes, and that'll take us to our next point right here, where we're going to talk about next hemostats. <laughs> we're going to talk about hemostats. So number one, we'll go over the anatomy of a hemostat, or needle drivers in some cases, as they're known as smaller ones. But Tony will take us through some of the basics of the anatomy. Yeah. It's a lot like a pair of scissors. The key differences is that you're not cutting anything, so these jaws are grippers. Well, there's, there's actually serrated edges right here that, are used, that are used to grip ones. Yes. Yeah. But the other key feature to you squeeze it closed, then the ratchet will lock. If you've gripped onto something, it means that you don't have to keep pressure on the two finger rings because the hemostat will hold your, your tissue for you. Yeah, and this is a big point for a lot of students when they're actually first using one of these, what they do is they ratchet up and then they still feel like they have to squeeze. You don't have to squeeze anymore if you've already ratcheted it up, okay? So you can actually loosen up your grip and be lighter. In order to disengage the ratchet, you have to push the finger rings a little bit side to side. And that's something that you'll just have to feel when you're, when you're doing this because it's difficult to demonstrate. If the ratcheting and locking gets in the way of you doing your work, you can gently, gently bend the two rings farther apart to disengage the ratcheting device so that then it acts more like a, a familiar pair of scissors. Uh, if you bend these too far, you can snap the whole device in half and be mindful that if you're bending this and you don't own it, you're actually altering somebody else's tool. All right. The other thing that we want to prevent with this is what we're going to call, it's a specific syndrome called hemostat thumb. So when people are gripping in, their hands will often be like this, and you can see the pressure that the, th the finger ring or thumb ring puts on the side of your thumb. This winds up over a long time in the lab, pinching nerves and causing, I've seen students with numbness and tingling, even get blisters from using this in this direction. So what you want to do is, yes, I can grip down and I can use a little bit of force, but I need to lighten up a little bit. and preferably changing your grip multiple times. So you can go to a grip that's an underhand, overhand, but once you've ratcheted it on with the click, click, all I have to do now is I can hold it from the outside like this with a nice level and balanced hand. So it's your choice to do it, but at the end of the day, we want to see you changing your position a lot of times, and we want to avoid repetitive single-use holds and hard grips whenever we can. The grip that you use on the hemostat will depend on the angle you're working at. So if you're working at something that's in front of you, using it like scissors, traditional scissor grip would be fine. If you're working vertically or if you're working on something that's pointing towards you, using a reverse scissor grip is better. It's better ergonomics and, uh, and, you'll, and it gives you the variety that's really important. Yeah. And we'll do a demo of this in a dissection in just a second. So 
All right, moving on to our next instrument, we are going to be looking at the scalpels and probes. So there are a couple of key things right here. So the probe is a wonderful instrument. It is beautiful for you working on finer tissue and moving your way through. It's nice to point at things with a probe. The scalpel, however, is also a wonderful instrument, but it is dangerous. This is a blade that we'll be using. We have a couple of options here. We have a scalpel that is a 21 versus a 10. You can see the different sizes that we have available for those. I would suggest to you finer work, smaller blade, more larger work, larger blade generally. A couple of key things that we want to get. Number one, picking up a scalpel. This is the handle. This is the blade. Please pick it up by the handle. Number two, carrying the scalpel. So if we are carrying the scalpel, the key thing that you want to do is scalpel blade is down when you are walking right here. Down and out of the way. There are, whoa, okay, well, it's not a scalpel. That was lucky. <laughs> You don't want to be talking with a scalpel blade in your hand. People will be very excited in the lab. They'll be moving their hands around like this, really animated. And when you do that, what's happening to the person beside you? They don't like it, all right? Perfect. So nerve wracking. It absolutely is. If you want to point at something, what you need to do is take your scalpel blade, put it down at the edge of the table so it's out of the way. Let everybody know that you did that. Because imagine this table filled with a donor on it and lots of different parts and all that spread out. If you're working through here and you want to point at something, now I can point, but you might also forget about it. And we've had injuries where people have forgotten about scalpels hidden underneath their donors, and when we're moving around, people can potentially slice themselves. So be very mindful of where your scalpel is. If it's available in the lab, even better than leaving it on the table, we'll be putting it at the central station at one end or other end of the table, just to make sure that no scalpel blades are lost. There's normally a tray available for your tools to all rest on and so that's the safest place especially when you go to turn your donor from supine prone remove all of the tools from the table period yeah but yeah if you can put them on the tray that's the best place. yes and another key point for this is sometimes it happens we'll be working into joints and finding our way around in different positions and you'll actually break a scalpel blade if you break or lose a scalpel blade everything has to stop on the table until that blade and all of its pieces are found we don't continue on unless all the scalpel pieces are actually found all right every single person on the table even if they're working on the opposite end of the table everybody stops working until you find the blade yeah or you're going to need stitches or a band-aid yes and this is one thing we're trying to avoid i'm looking for the perfect year where nobody actually jabs themselves or sticks themselves or cuts themselves so a couple of key things to realize this is a blade this is my hand. It, these things should never be in contact right here. You're going to be working very specifically trying to get in. No way. What do you need? You need a hemostat in that place where your hand will be anywhere close to working with the, with the blade edge. The parts of the scalpel blade that are important to be able to talk about is the sharp edge, the tip, and the back spine or spine of the blade. Those three different areas can be used differently to achieve different goals when you're working with your tissue on the table. One thing that we should talk about is also changing your scalpel blades on a regular basis. Don't do it. Don't do it. Absolutely not. Leave it to the professionals. We will have stations set up so you can avoid cut injuries and making sure that we're putting all of our scalpel blades into sharps and all of that good stuff. So at the end of the day, you will use your safe carrying technique when you think your scalpel blade is dull and it will happen faster than you think. The first day you're going to have to change your blade uh, many times because of the intimate connection between the superficial fascia and the skin layer. Yeah. Okay. And people wouldn't even believe how fast blades go dull working through this because it looks like it should be a nice soft tissue to work through. And in most lab dissections, people don't spend the time that we spend to look at this layer. So if you're really spending your time to separate skin from superficial fascia, it takes a lot of blade usage to do that. And the blades wear out really quickly when you're doing that. If you feel like you're really having to work to separate those layers, then your, your blades become dull and it's time to change it out. Yeah. yeah. So if you're at home and you have access to a scalpel and you want to learn, I normally wouldn't be this low, but for good ergonomics, I actually herniated a disc about a month ago too, so I'm trying to keep my back in different positions as we move right here, so this is part of it. That's yeah. a really important point. Oh, so yeah. for tall people, the work surface that we have in the lab isn't variable. It doesn't go up and down. So there will be stools normally in the lab, sometimes of different heights, and tall people, avoid stooping if you can. Find yourself a stool if you won't normally be kneeling. But yeah, and again, what am I going to be doing? I'm going to be doing some finer work right here, so that means I want to be relatively close to it. I don't want my face right in it, but I do want to be relatively close to it. So, for an example, we could take this wonderful orange. What is this? This is from Sumatra. Satsuma. Okay, oh, Satsuma orange. So, myself, I generally like the smaller blades. I like to do a bit of finer work through them. And I'm just going to use the tip of the blade to start an incision, even putting my other finger to the side, not directly in contact with the blade, but off to the side where I can use it as an anchor to initiate the beginning of an incision. 
Nick's using the pencil grip right now. If you're using the pencil grip, you want to make sure that your fingers are high up on the actual handle of the scalpel and that they don't slip down towards the blade or you're going to need band-aid or stitches. Yes, and that's why there's these little grooves right there for your thumb to actually be used on it. So you're anchored over to the side like this. The next thing is, it is a learned skill and it'll take you some time to do it, but you can actually palpate through a scalpel blade. When you're working through, you can feel yourself break through the first layer of skin, the dermis layer if you want to, call it that on this orange, can we call it that? Yep. Maybe we can. Yeah. All right. yeah. And you can go ahead and make a nice incision and then make a 90 degree incision and then start to work an edge of the tissue up if you can. And you can see I'm not quite deep enough, but I can use my scalpel blade to lift up that edge so I don't damage the tissue below. In the lab, we'll do another demo of this as well. But there you go. Now you can see a flap where I've lifted up the skin and I've separated without cutting the tissue below and we can work our way around like that. Now, in a real cadaver dissection, the tissue on the donor is a little bit more adhered than this with more cross bridging, but it's actually surprisingly similar even in its texture and sound that it makes with the undulations of the different dermal, dermal papillae running up and down and separating through. I should have a hemostat in my hand because what I'm doing is a small direction right here. What I would not do is this. Don't do this and think you're going to pull it back because now you can see how close you are. Now is a perfect time for a hemostat where we can go ahead, whatever grip it is. Maybe I just want to click it in a little bit, double click, and now it can be nice and gentle and I can start separating through. <laughs> This can happen. This can happen. It's okay. Yeah, the skin will have greater integrity than the, than the orange peel will, but this this happens and that's fine. Yeah, generally the skin is actually like leather, so you go and pull on it and you can't pull it apart. But when we're dealing with an orange here, obviously this orange is quite ripe, so we can see as an example. But regardless, basic skill set. This is actually a good example of the difference between the layers. Sometimes when people are making an incision through skin, they're not sure how deep to go because skin thickness varies depending on where on the body you're working. But you will be able to tell when you get a full thickness, like you would do with this orange rind here, that there's a difference between the actual top layer and the color and texture and uh, density of the layer below it. This is definitely not just within the skin layer that you are right now. Could you do an example of something where you're doing a, a reflection but you're not going deep enough so that you get a flat back from the... Ooh, within, within okay, it? so this will be tough on an orange. We can probably do it. But if I go ahead and I ins do my incision do my right incisions right here to start off my edge. If I started separating through and I ran through like this, so now you can see the layer of whiteness below. And we've had students do this where they've spent hours before somebody came in or they asked a question, am I too deep? All I've done here is separated layers of, oh, I was about to point with my scalpel. Bad, bad. And okay. heme step. And heme step, but that's okay. Take my probe. You can go ahead and see right here the layers of the skin that have been separated through or the skin of this orange and that would be a sup too superficial. Now, if we want to actually show this layer, this is a good use of the probe where you can do a stroking action and separate out if this was, for example, on our donor, the superficial fascia and skin layer right here and you can use gentle movements, but this is specifically for very fine work. And again, the best teacher is going to be experienced, so we'll show you guys this in the lab as well. The first days are relatively easy, but we'll come into this. When you're making a your first incision, you want to make sure you make a fairly long one. If I make a very short incision, and as you can see, this has more integrity than the orange did. And you may have to make more than one pass in an area before you actually start getting some depth. And, and that's okay too. I'm going to use my hemostat to pull up a little bit and tent the first layer so that I can see whether or not I'm all the way through. So tenting is the terminology we use for lifting up layers so we can actually see the edges. And Tanya's gonna to work through various edges on the blade itself for different regions here, so. I was using the tip and a little bit of the sharp edge and you can appreciate that there's a little bit of a difference. This is just like Nick's orange rind. And now I'm using this, the back or the, the back end of the blade. So we call this back blading where you use the back end. It's not actually a cutting edge, but you can use it to pick through like a finer end of, edge of a probe to work your way through that tissue. But if I only make a small incision, then I've made myself a buttonhole. And now I can't really access anything else. So making a longer incision to start with is a better idea. I can see that there's a little bit of a... Of a of a, a connection here but then there's a freedom between that other tissue so if I use the back of the blade again because I don't want to actually make a difference between these tissues I want to discover 
what is already there. And that's a good point. When you were dissecting, you're really an artist working your way through the tissue and you can make whatever you want to see visible. What happens for some students, they get a little bit too aggressive and dig in too much and we want to stay as light as possible if we can. Because we want to appreciate the function and the form of each one of the tissue layers. If I'm using my blade, I'm going to have more mm, effect on the tissue, but I'm only going to do that if I know better what I'm doing. Yeah, so to start with, we want everybody to start off nice and light, get gauge for the tools, how you hold them, how you move with them, and as your experience level increases, then you can go ahead and switch to different blade edges, depending on what you want to look for. If I'm using the sharp part of the blade, I can use that like a spatula instead of a cutting instrument where I'm drawing a line. I can be using it and I'm not even seeing what I'm doing. I'm feeling the inside layer of the skin. So I can see through that my blade is touching the inside layer and I'm scraping it like you would with a spatula rather than using that sharp edge as a perpendicular cutting. And this is a key skill that you want to have down. Again, back to palpation with these blades. You can palpate with the blade and what she's doing is holding it roughly 45 to 60 degrees and scraping her way back on the skin layer to make sure that the superficial fascia stays intact over top of the muscle tissue. You can see that I'm just skating along the surface and allowing those two different tissue layers, one that has more integrity and one that is filmier, allowing those to come apart. And this is excellent. Let's go ahead and just hold this up for everybody. So hold it up kind of an angle like this. Here you can see the underside of the skin intact. You can see the superficial fascia, this wispy stuff over top, and you can see the deeper fascia below that will eventually invest and wrap around the muscle tissue itself. This is exactly what we're looking for in our dissections as we do a layer by layer approach to specifically recognize and identify these tissues. A dissection instrument that you all have uh, is also your hands. There will be times to do what's called blunt dissection and it's okay to handle the tissue as long as I don't have a scalpel in my hand. So sometimes I can check to see if this relationship can be broken with my own hands. Now this is different because in the labs we'll be using fixed tissue usually. This is unfixed tissue which means the adherence of the tissue is substantially greater but an unfixed tissue, it is literally like peeling an orange. You can take your hand and run it through and separate the various edges of the tissue without any problem at all. There will be some rare occasions where we're going to recommend that you use your hand and a scalpel instead of your hemostat and your scalpel. More often when you're dealing with superficial fascia, which is a fluffier, looser, slipperier layer, uh, of tissue and, and then it's easier to get a hold on that and my hand is far enough away from the blade that I'm not at risk of having uh, a band-aid or, or stitches situation. Yes. Please do not contact the scalpel with your own hand. The one other thing I'll add to it as well is if we work into larger tissue areas, what you can also do, Tanya, if I may, mm -hmm. what you can also do is probably with a hemostat is going to be safer for most of you to start with until your skill level gets up. What you can do is go ahead and hemostat grip and I can do my pulling that way or I can cut myself a little bit of a window where I sink in and you want to make sure it's big enough and you look at it and say I don't know that this is going to work it actually works very very well so I've created this window and what you can do is with your own hand you can hook it through that tissue and now I can go ahead and pull back so picture this on a large donor right here and now I have good leverage to go ahead and move from side to side and there is no way that my scalpel should be in contact with this finger. I'll be working further down here, very fine movements, just nice separations to get that tissue off. So getting a little bit of tissue tension on the tissue tension tension on the tissue, which is where you would have it, uh, makes a big difference to the efficacy of your tool. So you can separate off the superficial fascia and the deep investing fascia around the muscles. And in the fixed cadavers, the superficial fascia is going to look way different from this it will look very generally yellow, like yellow underlay from our carpet or something. It's a, it's a very distinct layer, and on some donors, it's a very generous layer. Yeah. And so if you're looking at this movement from Tanya right here, I feel safe with her skill set. Generally, we wouldn't be holding this close together, but you can see that she started to separate out some of the other tissues here, and... Yes, thank you. Cutting away from my friend. Yes, you can see the muscle layer starting right there. So if you are dissecting and you find yourself and we're still in the skin layer or superficial fascia and you see muscle fibers, you are too deep into that tissue. 
there will be times if you're working on uh, facial regions or if you're working on the back of the hand, the dorsum of the hand, there's not going to be very much uh, superficial fascia at all. But you will still be able to tell the difference between your very distinct uh, dermal layer, the skin layer, the dermis, and whatever's lying beneath it. It'll be slippery and shiny, or if you do see muscle fibers, just stop. So one thing that Tanya is doing really well too here, when we are doing our dissections, I like to have our donors open up like a book. So that means we maintain layers so you can see skin, superficial fascia, deep fascia, muscle, down to ligaments, down to bones and joints, even into bone marrow. And all of that is visible so you can see where you've come from. In most dissection experiences, people do not get to see, once a layer is done, it's gotten rid of. But we try and maintain areas so you can see the layers of the different windows available. And don't be afraid to palpate. Yes. You've got gloves on, yes. and even if you didn't have gloves on, these folks are fixed and preserved and, and probably cleaner than you in many cases. <laughs> so if we look at this edge, you can see all the layers that we were talking about here, all the, all the way through from bone all the way back up. Something else that you can do, I'm just looking for something ligamentous or a penetrating muscle. I want to see something that I can strum with the instrument, the back of the blade. Yeah, so if you're working through the muscle layers or fascial layers and you find a nerve or a vessel that you want to work through, you can go ahead and use the tip of the blade or even a probe and slowly take your time through it. Especially important when we're working around glandular tissue that might break apart a little bit easier, like the adrenal glands or the parotid gland, depending on where we are in the body. And the same thing, circle of willis, all these small, very intricate vessels you really want to take your time with. All right, so let's go ahead and review how to take gloves off. This is a fundamental skill. I can't believe how many people don't know how to do this in their medical professions. Let's make sure we get this right to save yourself contamination. You're gonna take your gloves off every time you take a break. You can take your gloves off whenever you break for lunch. You can take a glove off if you should happen to puncture it or have a cut in it, whatever else it is. So we're both gonna demo here really quick. Hand is out like this. Go ahead and grip the glove, invert it, so it's this direction right here, and pull it off so it goes reverse, okay? Take that part of the glove, rub it into your hand, put it into your hand like this. Now you're gonna grip underneath this side of the glove, and you can grip however you like to come in there. Invert it again, and you've got this wonderful carrying baggie, whoa, <laughs> this wonderful carrying baggie, where you can go ahead and put this into the garbage. All right, so that's how you take a glove off. All right, thank you very much for your time, and hopefully you found this very useful.